Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, I got you. Oh, thanks, bro. Not being so serving. Well, guys, I um, yeah, we've got uh, it's it's the Atkins last Sunday here. Also, it's it's Anna Freeman's last Sunday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's uh, so we got John John Freeman's here in town and his dad. Good to see you, bro. Uh, but yes, that's. So this is all so sad. It's like, man, people, that, I remember when Anna was a freshman, I feel like I blinked, and now she's graduating, um, so, but she has endeared herself to so many of us here, so many of the families, and she's babysat and serving that way. Um, obviously, she's brilliant. She's getting her master's. She's going to University of Illinois. <laughs> Architecture, she'll probably design some brilliant house one day that's like the model of all the... <laughs> Like, oh man, that's the that's the Freeman, you know, that's the Freeman design or something crazy like that. But Anna's really smart and been a great part of our campus ministry. Her boyfriend Cameron's here with us as well. Welcome back, brother. And uh, but yeah, you know, it's it's sad. I just I, I have all these memories of Anna being in her backyard for different campus ministry stuff and her hanging out with my daughter and I don't know teaching her stuff that she shouldn't be teaching. Her, you know? <laughs> Is Anna records me at different um, ministry events, and uh, and it's always I have this really bad just resting face, and Anna is, is a master of capturing that. So if you want to see some comedy, if you want to see some comedy, just ask to see Anna's phone, and she'll see you some very embarrassing video footage of me, and you'll be you'll be encouraged. You will be. You'll just see yourself. We'll miss you, girl. So grateful for you. We love you. And. Um, Obviously, Matt and Ashley and, and Stone and Eli have been a big part of our family here now. I feel like we just blinked. I remember first meeting them and, and before they even officially moved here. And uh, you guys have been such, it's just been awesome to be in the battle with you guys. I mean, it really has. And you guys just give, have given your heart in every way. Obviously, when Matt sings, we all feel that. Um, when Ashley prepares a meal for you, we've all felt that. And uh, the kids are, you know, they run around. They're, they're like big brothers to so many of our kids. And they just... Uh, they're, they're like, yeah, they just look out. They look out for so many of the younger kids. So um, we're excited to send you guys off to Denver. You guys are going to be a blessing to them for sure. They have no idea how what the, the treasures we're going to get with you guys. So um, love you guys as well. And uh, we're grateful just for, you know, just you, you, this is the kingdom of God, right? It's just part of what it is. You, you get, you know, God allows us to cross paths, and, and we get to have memories. And then, you know, sometimes God allows us to go in different paths as well. So. Um, but we love you guys, and we're grateful, and I'm going to pray so that, you know, help me keep it together, all right? Father, good morning. Uh, thank you so much, Father, for uh, the memories, God, the family that we always get to build uh, through, through just being uh, disciples together. Um, God, it, it is, uh, it's, it's bittersweet, it, these moments, um, but also reminds us that, man, it's bittersweet because it is family, and uh, if it wasn't family, if it wasn't real, if it wasn't actually you, um, this would just be ships passing in the night, and, uh, you know, this wouldn't really mean anything, God, but because this is real, because we share in the unity of the bond of peace, as it says in Ephesians, this does mean something. This does, and it, and it should always hurt a little bit, God, and, uh, well, it hurts a lot, God, so uh, more than just a little bit, God, I think I just say that, just trying to soften the blow in my heart, God, but, um, Pray for these guys, pray for them to just do awesome things in their next stages. We know they're going to do awesome things. We know they're going to represent you and, and your, your spirit uh, in amazing ways. Um, but I pray, God, just for this time, the rest of our time together, I pray, God, that you just speak through your word, and that your spirit moves, and that it is your heart that we, we are able to take in, soak in, so that we can proclaim your heart and proclaim your love uh, this week as we go out and serve others. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, turn your Bibles back to Hebrews chapter 7. We're going to start in 6, the last verse of verse 6. Uh, but there's a few things as well I want to catch us up on. Um, some family announcements. You know, obviously we're family. We, we get to build up family with God. Next Sunday is building cleanup. Yes. So please come ready to, to roll your sleeves up. Wear your casual gear. Don't come in here looking like me with a suit and tie on, all right? Um, so just wear whatever. Um, and we're going to have hot dogs. Jim Snell is going to be on the grill. 
Papa Jim's going to be grilling on the ones and twos like he always does. And uh, we got hot dogs, chips, ice cream, all the healthy stuff, all right? So we'll, we'll make sure you guys are very healthy as we clean up this building. All right, you, you will be well-fueled um, in every way as we uh, do repairs to our building that, that need it. So thank you guys so much in advance for always loving up on this blessing that we have that we stumbled upon nine years ago. Um, so thank you guys for take, take, taking care of this place, amen? So casual Sunday, bring your lawn chairs, okay? Because it is a work day. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Not sure what happened there. <coughs> That's happening to me. Bring your lawn chairs. <coughs> People leave, and this happens to me. Um, bring your lawn chairs, because we're, we're, we're going to be having a work day, so the last thing we need to do is set up tables and take them down. So just pre- please bring your lawn chair or two so you can share it. So that will be next weekend. And the following weekend is the luau. All right. So we are not going to have anything here. Um, once again, I, if you guys uh, are not planning on going to St. Louis with us, once a year we, 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 we go to uh, – well, this is the first one since COVID happened. But we go to St. Louis and we celebrate there with a the church there. They host us. We wear lays and we pretend we're in Hawaii as we go to church, all right? But um, uh, once again, if, you're gonna, if, if you cannot make the trip, please let your family group leader know and we'll figure something out here locally for you, some kind of house church situation, and we'll get you taken care of, amen? We had graduation weekend as well. So we got some, some graduates to recognize. Kaylin McElwain graduated. Her, we got all the McElwains here. So want to wanna welcome the McElwain clan. The whole tribe is here, which is awesome. And uh, Kaylin gave the speech for the journalism program, and she knocked it out of the park. She did awesome. So um, you guys would have been all proud. She, she did the Lord proud, amen. And uh, Sam Mount graduated. Uh, so... And he, uh, Sam's sticking around, and he's doing the one-year challenge. If you don't know what that is, the one-year challenge is uh, for recent graduates. It's just something that uh, our church is due to, you know, uh, if you're a recent graduate and, and you want to just serve the ministry you're at for a year and just, you know, get a job, not necessarily in your field, but just serve and sacrifice, you can go for it. And Sam decided to take on that and help us out here for another year. So God bless you, brother. Thank you, man. Anna Freeman obviously graduated. Uh Hazel Hawkins graduated. Yeah. Nate Schrader graduated. Yeah. That's a miracle. So, praise God. Praise God. There is a God. Uh, no, Nate's persevered through, through, through some stuff, amen. So I'm glad he really he stuck with it. And then we got some masters. Uh, Ron Aradonis got his masters yesterday. And... Uh, Edwin Davis gets his master's today, all right? So, obviously, special time, right? We got people graduating, making great, you know, great headway in their careers and and, in their professional lives. And it's so important that we acknowledge these things because this is a part of the future, right? Part of our future is being established as we uh, accomplish these goals, these goals that you, you do, you work so hard for and and uh, you you persevere through, and it really does. It it really can do a lot, right? There's a lot of doors that are opened up as these guys are are, are taking these next steps. And, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today a little bit is how what we do today and even how our past can really impact where things go from here, not just on an obviously professional or academic level, but more importantly on a spiritual level. The, the, The actions of the present and maybe even sometimes how we look back on our past actions can have an impact on maybe how God, how we see God in the future. And I, I appreciate this. We're, you know, we're going to go back to Hebrews today. And this chapter in Hebrews helps us see God's heart for our destiny. In the one sense that, man, he always has a plan. And regardless of how we feel about our past, sometimes we have mixed feelings, right, about what's happened to us or the things we've done. And we're going to look at today how God can redeem our past so that our future can be different in a way that is powerful, so that we experience miracles. Amen. So the title this morning, Hebrews 7, 
a greater destiny? How can God give each of us as a family a greater destiny as we lean into the ways he wants us to see not just our past, but also our future? Hebrews chapter 6, we're going to start in verse 20. And uh, let's just start in verse 19. So Davion preached on this a few weeks ago, so we're going to kind of continue on that. Chapter 6 of Hebrews verse 19 says, We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain where our forerunner, Jesus, has entered on our behalf. He has become a high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. All right, so we're going to learn more about who Melchizedek is right now. This Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God most high. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. Then also, king of Salem means king of peace. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days or end of life, resembling the son of God, he remains a priest forever. Just think how great he was. Even the patriarch, Abraham, gave him a tenth of the plunder. Now the law requires the descendants of Levi, who become priests, to collect a tenth from the people. That is, from their fellow Israelites, even though they are also descended from Abraham. This man, speaking of Melchizedek, however, did not trace his descent from Levi, yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. In the one case, the tenth is collected by people who die, but in the other case, Melchizedek's, by him who is declared to be living. One might even say that Levi, who collects the tenth, paid the tenth through Abraham, because when Melchizedek uh, met Abraham, Levi was still in the body of his ancestor. There's a lot there we can take away, but the main point, first point, if we're going to fulfill a greater destiny, we must first Remember that Jesus represents a greater past. He represents a greater past. What does that mean? Let's remember here that the the audience, once again, of Hebrews were mostly Christians who used to be Jewish. But even to these Jews who would have been familiar with the Old Testament, Melchizedek was still a fairly enigmatic figure, pretty mysterious. They didn't know too much about him. His name only appears in the book of Genesis um, Genesis 14, to be exact, if you want to do, re- do your research on that, it's there. And it, once again, in Psalm 110, which is quoted later in this passage. So the, re- the Hebrew writer reminds them of who Melchizedek was. He gives them this Cliff Notes version, right, in this chapter. But right off the bat, we see in verse 2, we see that Abraham, before the priesthood of Israel was ever started, he gave Melchizedek a tenth of the plunder that he just won. He was in a war right before this, and he gave a tenth. If that does not sound like a big deal to you, the Hebrew writer makes it plain why in verse 4, right? He says, think of how great Melchizedek was. Let's just stop here and think about it. Even Abraham, Father Abraham, right? You sing songs about this guy as soon as you make it to kingdom, kids. It's how great and important he was. Father Abraham himself, Gave this mysterious figure a tenth of everything he just won. The battle he had just won, and he gave it voluntarily. Like just off the cuff of winning this war, he says, hey, you get, you get a tenth of everything we just won. So we also have to remember, this was long before God had given his people the law and the requirement that they should give a tenth of what they had to the priests. This was completely and totally voluntary on behalf of Abraham. So there's this idea that, wow, Melchizedek was a big deal. This man was great. Because the, the greatest, Abraham, the model of our faith, gave this guy a tenth, and didn't, he didn't even have to. So automatically, the audience is like, wow, this guy was something different. And then the writer traces this very important connection in verses 6 and 7, right? It says, this man, however, did not trace his descent from Levi. Yet he collected a tenth from Abraham and blessed him who had the promises. And without a doubt, the lesser is blessed by the greater. He makes it pretty flat out obvious there. Melchizedek blessed Abraham. 
Abraham gave him a tenth. Who is greater here? Melchizedek was. And because Melchizedek was greater than Abraham, then it only makes sense that any priest who is from the order of Melchizedek would be greater than any priest that would ever come from Abraham. And the priests of Levi, the, the regular priests, the, the, any priest that would ever minister from here in the Old Covenant, guess where they came from? Levi came from Abraham. So the writer here, what's, what does all this mean? The writer is making this argument because Jesus' priesthood is connected to Melchizedek's, then Jesus' priesthood as one man, one man alone, he was greater than than all the priests combined that ever served from the tribe of Levi and Abraham before him. This one man priesthood was greater than all the priests that ever existed prior to him. So the writer was reminding his audience that as Christians, their priest was Jesus. Not all those other guys, not those guys who were sinful as well and failed in many ways, but your priest was Jesus. And because of Jesus' connection to Melchizedek, the, Jesus represented a greater past than all the priests who came before him. I believe that Jesus representing a past that was greater was important to these Jewish Christians because their past was filled. If you read up and down the Old Covenant, there's a lot of failures in the priesthood. A lot of mishaps. A lot of faithlessness. A lot of sin. And the priests were a big part of why Israel as a whole did not stay faithful to God. If you read many of the prophets, who are the prophets calling out? The priests. It's like, you guys ain't ministering. You're fake. You're hypocrites. You're liars. Why are you even ministering? Isaiah said so much about the priesthood because they would not stay faithful to God. They refused to trust in the Lord. And so you could kind of look at their past, and, and, and you could even think if you were a Jew, you could look at your past and be like, man, we've really botched it before. <laughs> the best of us, the priests, the people who were supposed to minister to us and help us be spiritual, even they weren't spiritual. How are we going to help the world? We can't even help ourselves. Is that a tape that any of us have ever played in our minds before? How am I supposed to help somebody, help my neighbor? I'm trying to keep my house together. And there's this temptation for them and even for us as people to let our failures in the past define our futures. But because they had Jesus, because their, their priest was now Jesus, they no longer had to be defined by the failures of the past. If their priest was Jesus, they could say, hey, you know what? I come from the line, not of Levi, but from the line of Melchizedek. So this, is, this didn't just matter for them. This matters to us today. You may be like, who is Melchizedek? That's a long name. Who would ever name their son Melchizedek? I hope you don't name your son Melchizedek, right? But this should matter to us because too many times we have allowed the failures of our past to define how we choose to live today. It's pretty simple, right? Oh, I've shared my faith with so many people and I've gotten so many rejections. Why would I share my faith today? It's an easy one, right? That's cherry picking. <laughs> that happens like all the time to me. But maybe not even failures, but too many times maybe we've allowed the tragedies we've endured, things out of our control, to taint our ability to just be present with God and to have an excitement in our walk with him. We may not think about the failures of the Levitical priesthood, but I do know we can struggle with thinking about our failures as husbands or as wives. We can struggle with forgiving ourselves, with our failures maybe in terms of our, not just our evangelism, but maybe our purity. Maybe it's our uh, inability to be good friends. Maybe we've, we don't forgive ourselves because we haven't been there for people. And because we've messed up as dads, moms, sons, daughters, because we've just flat out messed up as disciples sometimes, we can allow our past 
mess and mishaps to limit our faith about how God can work through us today and in the future. If Satan does not use mistakes or sins from our past to discourage us, then he, will, he, he can use trauma and trials, past trials, as a reason for us to not trust what God can do moving forward. Because if we prayed this prayer and that sick person did not get well, what's, how could God make this situation any different? Why would I pray again? I prayed before and nothing happened. That person still suffered. That person had to go through. I prayed, God, I prayed. Lord, you know how I prayed. And nothing changed. So why should I pray again? I prayed for this person to give up their life for you, and they didn't change. They walked away from God. Why would I pray? Why would I put my heart out there to get crushed again? If if, if it felt like God left us hanging before, or we lost a job, or we lost a friend, then why wouldn't he leave us hanging again? It's a temptation I can feel in my heart sometimes. These are challenges that Satan will use to let us define our past with those trials or those failures, and we will hold ourselves back. That is what holds us back from living faithfully in the future and in the present. How does your past limit your faith in God at this moment? How does your past limit your faith in God at this moment? It's a, a very important question. Because our past, in one sense, if we don't process it right, and if we don't get open about it with, 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 with the, the people that God puts in our lives and we don't pray about it, and, and we wonder sometimes, man, why, why am I not more zealous? Why am I not more bold? Why am I not more trusting? Why am I not more vulnerable? Why am I not more humble? It's because we have a shell. Things have happened to us. And Satan's like, you got to keep that up like Fort Knox, man, because no one's going to understand. Has any past experience jaded your view of what God may choose to do in your life today? Have you been jaded? Life has jaded me in some ways. If we're honest, I think we all have been jaded a little bit. The importance of Melchizedek being a precursor to Jesus and a precursor to us is highlighted in verse 3. We don't know where he came from or where he was born. He literally comes out of nowhere. There is no explanation of who this man is if you read Genesis 14. We don't know how he died. There's no explanation about that. He literally just comes in, and he leaves. We don't know who his parents were. We don't know if he had any kids. In one sense, Jesus being connected to him symbolizes that when we follow Jesus, we all have a fresh start. When we follow Jesus, we are no longer defined by our flaws or even the flaws of our ancestors. Sometimes we think, oh, if it wasn't, if it wasn't me that messed up, it was my family that messed up which is also, in some ways, very viable and legitimate. Our families affect us, right? But when we follow Jesus, our story is no longer tied to what our forefathers struggled with. A uh, little extra verse here for you guys in 1 Peter. I think we got a slide for that. I'll just read it from there. 1 Peter 1, verse 18. This is one of my favorite verses. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without de uh, blemish or defect. When we became Christians, our story, and even our family's story, with all of its beauty and ugliness, it became intertwined with the story of Jesus. We are now not just children of our physical fathers. We are children of the living God. I want to ask you guys a question that I'd like for you to write down and meditate on this week. How has Jesus changed the trajectory of your life since you became a disciple? Maybe you're not a Christian yet, but how is Jesus changing the story of your life as you learn what it means to follow Jesus? 
we got to think, we got to think that these are the things that should encourage us. Right? Where were we headed before someone showed us the truth in the scriptures? What were the things we thought, that's Christianity, and it's empty. And, and I, but I guess this is the only Christianity I've ever known. So I'm going to keep going to church. And someone showed you, no, that's not Christianity. There's a reason why you're going to bed at night. You're having existential thoughts. Because that's not it. That's not repentance. You have no idea. And remember the first time you figured out what it looked like, and it was so scary, and you learned how to do it? It's like riding a bike for the first time. You're scared. You're just, just pedaling, trying not to fall, and you keep going. How is Jesus giving you a greater past to be defined by? As we think and pray about how Jesus has given us a greater past, I believe that as we process this and we talk through this with one another, we will be inspired to live a greater future. Amen? We're going to finish up in verse 11. It says, if perfection could have been attained through the Levitical priesthood, and indeed the law given to the people established that priesthood, why was there still a uh, need for another priest to come, one in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Aaron or, or Levi, same thing essentially? For when the priesthood is changed, the law must be changed also. He of whom these tribes are said belong to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever served at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord descended from Judah. And in regard to that tribe, Moses said nothing about priests. And what we have said is even more clear if another priest like Melchizedek appears, one who has become a priest, not on the basis of a regulation as to his ancestry, but on the basis of the power of an indestructible life. For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So if we want to, in one sense, take in and accept the greater destiny that God has for us as his family, we, not, we don't just have a greater past that Jesus represents. Jesus also represents a greater future. He represents a greater future. There are many spiritual insights we can draw out from this passage today. But what inspires me is this idea that Jesus' priesthood was not a result of his ancestry. You know, there's sometimes we get, we get mad at people like, oh, you're just, you're just rich because, you know, you, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. You know, you just inherited that. You, know, you didn't earn it, man. Like, you know, your parents earned that, right? And, you know, we're Americans. We got you to gotta, you gotta work your way to the top, right? Jesus is not that. Rather, God allowed Jesus to be a priest and I love this, this writing of the Hebrew writer. He says, because of his, the power of an indestructible life. That's who Jesus was. The Greek for indestructible literally means unstoppable. The man was unstoppable. Nothing has ever stopped Jesus. Not a sin we commit that seems so egregious that we could never forgive ourselves for. Nothing stopped him from pursuing any one of us. Nothing has ever stopped him, not even death. Even today, his Holy Spirit inspires, changes, and it moves his disciples. If you are a Christian, you have submitted your life to, to not just, oh, I'm in this, this, this church and I, we go to this building. No, no, you have submitted your life to be part of this unstoppable force. It is not just I check in and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, we go to Zoom if we need it. No, that's not it. This is an unstoppable force that helps as many people as possible experience the love from God that we first experienced ourselves. That's who Jesus is. But not only do we get to have a priest who's never stopped changing hearts from the moment he stepped foot on this earth, but we also have a priest who serves forever. We're talking, we're talking that kid from Sandlot forever, that forever. You know, that's, I guess that's forever, forever. Because he is not from the order of Levi, but from the order of Melchizedek. Every priest before Jesus had a temporary moment in eternity as priest. Even if they were good priests, right? They could only serve for so long until they passed away. 
But Jesus will always be our priest, and he'll always intercede for us. He'll always be on our side. So Jesus as a priest, he does not just represent a greater past. He represents a much greater and brighter future. You know, there was a gentleman graduating yesterday. He was walking the stage, and me and the brother, man, was wearing sunglasses. <laughs> I'm like, wow. And then Nate goes, man, his future is so bright. He's got to wear sunglasses, you know. <laughs> I'm like, that's, that's an old joke, Nate, but I'll take it. That's kind of fun. I'll give you a chuckle. You know, but I was like, that's funny. I was like, that's, the guy, I was like, wow, that's amazing. You know, guys, sometimes we, and I appreciated the, 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 the swagger of that gentleman. Because he was like, ah, I'm graduating. I made it. I'm going to put these glasses on, and I'm going to own it. I'm going to walk across that stage. And, you know, there's some, there's some parts that he's like, that's kind of goofy. But honestly, sometimes the way we, 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 we process our Christianity, we're just so like, mm-hmm. <laughs> hey, you know, Jesus, God, yeah, yeah, we don't have to be arrogant about it, right? Jesus said, blessed are the meek. But there's a way to be meek and, and, and be bold about who God is. Not who we are, but the God we serve and that's redeemed us. So even if your personality is very, like, introverted, you got something to say. You got something to share. Because God has taken over your life, and he's done miracles in your life. Your future is bright. It's brighter than anyone that, that is confident enough to go across the stage with sunglasses on. Jesus as a priest represents a greater future. When we decide to put a stop to our desires and our own will, and we decide to follow Jesus, the indestructible and unstoppable King of Kings, we don't just stop our past from defining us anymore. We now have a reason to always be hopeful about the days to come. We now have a priest. He won't just stop. He'll never stop interceding for us, right? He'll never stop loving us. He'll never stop believing in us. He'll never stop dreaming for us. He'll never stop leading us to potentially life-changing moments and miracles. The next miracle is always just around the corner if you follow Jesus. Now, our future will never be perfect because Jesus' life was not perfect. Amen? But because of Jesus, our future, regardless of what happens, we can always count on it drawing us closer to God and the people that he puts in our path. Do we believe as a church, that our future can be life-changing, that our lives will change for the better, that not necessarily circumstantially, but our characters will change, and that we'll see God do amazing things, not just in our lives, but in the lives of people that we're sharing the gospel with. Do we believe it? Do, can we envision that? I think sometimes we don't think enough about what God can do through a group of people wholeheartedly surrendered to his will. When we think about the future, do we hesitate to believe that God can work through us? Do we have hesitations about the future? I know I do. That's just me being honest. I have plenty of hesitations. My wife's had more health procedures in the past year and a half since we had our miscarriage and I'm, I'm like, what is this? What is this world of we are? We might always hit our deductible this year. That's never happening. I'm like, amen. We hit our deductible. <laughs> but it's like, amen. Like, you know, you can celebrate it, but you know, it's tough. It's hard. Like, we're just trying to have another kid. I'm not trying to figure this stuff out now. So I have hesitations. But how do we process those hesitations? How do we process, how do we, how do we bring those doubts to the foot of God? I think something that's important for us to accept was that if Jesus was going to be the priest of the Hebrew Christians and our priest today, it means that our life would be greater. Not because of necessarily just the miracles that happened to us, but because they, and you think about the first century church, they experienced miracles not just in their lives, but in the lives of the people they touched. 
that's all the book of Acts was about. And that's not to say that we won't experience miracles ourselves, because at one point, we were those same people that someone else shared their faith with. But I think the Hebrew writer was sharing this connection with Melchizedek because he wanted to inspire these persecuted Christians to continue to persevere. That, man, you know what you're going through right now? You're being ostracized. Your community is is trying to outcast you. But the future has something good in it. Hold on. You know, Kevin Eppinger and Greg Newby would know this better than me, but if you're going to keep running a marathon, you need to be able to answer why. Because I don't know this. I haven't ran an insane amount of mileage in my life. But why would you run six more miles when you already ran 20? You're in it. You're just like, I've ran 20 miles. Why am I doing this to myself? Did you guys ask those questions? (laughs) That was a firm, oh, yeah. It's like, this is insane. Why am I in this race? Why am I taking another step? These Christians and, and that we read about, and honestly, us today, we're being called to persevere and not tire of doing the good we know we ought to do because we have a priest named Jesus who will minister to us forever. He will keep running that race with us every step of the way until we meet him in heaven. And until that day, you and I, we also get to be priests like Jesus. First Peter says we are a royal priesthood. So our future is greater, not just because Jesus is going to minister to us exclusively and give us everything we want like a bunch of spoiled children. Our future is greater because Jesus will minister to us us the way he deems necessary, and not just what we want, but he will also allow us to minister to others. And as we minister to others, we will experience the same miracles that the first century church did, which had nothing to do with wealth, prosperity, their kids being on the honor roll, or getting the nicest jobs in Greco-Roman society. It had nothing to do with that. The miracles the first church experienced was seeing people be healed physically and spiritually. In Acts 4, when they were starting to get persecuted, they prayed this prayer that shook the earth, right? It literally shook the earth. It was interesting, is in that prayer, they say, God, consider their threats. And you think the next prayer is, consider their threat, their threats, then stop the threats. No, no, no. They say, consider their threats, know that we're being threatened, then give us boldness. Give us, don't change what's out there. Change us so that we can overcome it and rise above it. This morning, what kind of future do we want? We know what kind of future the Acts Church wanted. They looked at the future with all the trials and all the troubles and all the unseen and unknown. And they said, we got God. Bring it. Bring it. Because the testimony is going to be greater. So bring it. What kind of future do we want? Family, let's pray. Think. And maybe jot down, what are the miracles God, God, not you. (laughs) What are some miracles that God maybe wants you to experience in the future? Which, Which friends can you imagine? helping them learn what it means to follow Jesus? How can you see their lives changing? Visualize it, pray about it, think about how can their lives change? How can you see their family dynamics change? Their parenting change? Their marriage change? Their habits? Some of us, we know people, we're like, oh, man, those habits, that's not good, bro. (laughs) Like, I've been there, man, and I, that's tough. You got to. How can you see their, their, their and, and as their habits change, their peace and their happiness change, their character change, then how can God change your character in the process? As God works miracles in the hearts around you, how can God work a miracle in your heart? As God softens hearts around us, how can our hearts be softened? 
you know, we have Mission Midweek this Wednesday. And that's something we do once a month, right? For those of you that are new, we, 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 we have nothing scheduled officially on Wednesdays. We use that Wednesday as, hey, we're going to go out. We're going to minister. We're going to be like Jesus this week. We're not going to come here. We're going to go out because Jesus was out. How can God use this Wednesday as a step towards a miracle, not just for you, but someone that you're trying to show the love of God towards? Maybe you're choosing to engage in serving the poor or the community in some way this Wednesday. How can God use your service to lead to a miracle in someone else's life who needs a miracle? If you believe that God has miracles that he wants you to experience in your future, we have a greater destiny in front of us, church. We really do. And it starts with thinking about our past and wrestling with that. If you wrestle with things, it, it, it is a great time as ever. It's summertime. These are, these are the best times to go on long prayer walks with a buddy, with a friend, and just, just pray through the things you've, got, you've felt and just talk through it. You never know where you may stumble. You may decide to, you know, some of us some, go on prayer run. I don't know why, but mile 20, you may hit the, the epiphany you've been looking for. <laughs> Everyone's like, no. <laughs> Even Kevin and Greg are like, no. <laughs> But just work through that. Pray through that. Go through that with God. Wrestle with God about that. And you will, I, I believe we will experience and imagine and visualize and have a vision for the greater future that God has in store for us. Where lives can change, not just in here, but more importantly out there because that's who God has called us to minister to. To build family outwards and see them and whoever it is he puts in our path become part of his family. Amen? Amen. Love you guys. Thank you. Right. So um, I get to respond, <laughs> but it's a, but it's a hard thing to respond to, just because it makes me think so many things. And so it's like, should I do it? Should I not do it? So I'm gonna do it because what are they gonna do? Kick me out? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, I just I, I just think about so many of the points, right? I, I mean, just that Jesus represents a better past because so much, um, Columbia has been an amazing place for me. Um, you know, some of my best friends are here. Um, sometimes what I consider even the first friends of my lifetime. You know, and it takes like, you know, 36, seven years to reach that point. And, you know, you can look back and you're like, man, you think about the physical abuse the sexual abuse, the homelessness, right? The, the, the disabilities, the deaths of my father, the death of my son, the, the, you know, having kids and feeling like, man, like, can they even love me? You know, and people ask, like, how did you, like, not do drugs and die like your brother? How did you not do drugs like the other folks in your family? Like, what was the thing? And sometimes I think about, uh, you know, obviously it was God, but I look back and it's like, well, it was kind of because I was a little bit annoying and I didn't have any friends to take me down that road. <laughs> and so, you know, it's like, but, but like the thing is like, that's what I look at. And that's, what, and so as I like look forward, it's like, man, this is like the future, this is the past that I'm trying to build from. But then it's like, um, I remember Jason Touche being here on my first men's retreat here, and I remember he, it was like this rabbit trail. It wasn't even like his point of his lesson. We were at this men's retreat, and he's like, hold on. Who, who here is like first-generation Christian, right? You know, first-generation disciple of Jesus. And he was just like, man, sometimes you sit there and, you know, you beat yourself up about, you know, rocks and pebbles that, like, go through your legs. But, like, in all reality, like... The, our ancestors handed down to me, to us, like this worthless way of life. And like you're sitting there trying to hold it back from your kids and your family, right? And like you, you sit here and you just see this past behind you of these waves and these rocks tumbling down the hill. But then you look and you see Jesus, this lighthouse behind this wave. And you're like, hold on a second. That's a better past, you know? 
and, and then when I look forward, like I get to look forward to, you know, friendships and friends that are closer than a brother like Jesus, you know, the ultimate brother, right? And I even think about my kids, my boys, you know, that like, man, they don't have the same past, you know, as me. But at the same time, like I am that not so good past. And they get to look back eventually to a better past in Jesus because of Jesus in my life as well. Right. And then they get to have that same relationship. And then as I look forward and I just uh, you guys and Jesus like so much are a part of that better future. And I'm just grateful just for um, you being a part of the journey. Um, you know, I, I, I've been going to therapy a lot since I've been here, and I've learned that one of the things that I do to defend against emotion and feeling things is I smile a lot. <laughs> that's, my, that's my defense mechanism. Yeah. So if you ever wonder why I'm always grinning and happy, like, look at that. That's, that's yeah, I, I'm defensive, yeah. But again, thank you for the message. I thought, you know, I didn't even really have a plan to share this, but I just, as I was sitting there, I was thinking about, man, it is so hard for me to live any other way other than thinking that, like, man, the best is yet to come. And when you think about even where you're at, like, I, there have been major setbacks in my life. There's been major setbacks in your life. You know, but like even at that point, like that's the difference between those who like see Jesus and view death and see Jesus and view it as like this fragrance of life is because they can sit there and see that. And it's like the best is yet to come. I think about one day, who knows when that'll be right sitting on my deathbed and like I just I don't know, I cannot live any other way that the best is yet to come, you know, and Jesus is that better future. And I thank you guys for being a part of that with me. Let's pray. God, you are a great and merciful God. You had plans from before we were born. God, you, even though it, like this timeline doesn't even exist, like from the beginning to the end, it's all happening for you, God. And I just, it, it blows my mind. I can't even comprehend that. But God, you have given us such a better past, something better to, to reach back to, this riches, these things that I don't have to be the man that I was. I don't have to be even the man that I am, but I can be the man who you created me to be, God. And I thank you that the best is still yet to come, God, that we have an eternity with you, God, forever. God, and I just, I, I, I still, it's so hard to comprehend. But I thank you that we got to have these partners, partners in Jesus partners in this life, partners in the struggle, partners in the joy, partners in the sadness, God, to walk forward and to remind each other, man, we're not who we were. We are who we say you are, God, and we have you and eternity and your glory to look forward to, and I'm grateful. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.